I'm Ala Efimova. And I'm Terry Cohn. And welcome to the fourth episode of our video blog, where we talk to artists, scholars, curators about Sonia Rappaport's conceptual project, Objects on My Dresser. Between 1979 and 1983, as she mourned her mother's recent death, the artist collaborated with a psychiatric social worker to analyze and interpret the personal significance of mementos and souvenirs that accumulated on her bedroom dresser. The project unfolded over five years in what Rappaport called phases or iterations, which we now researched and documented for an upcoming book, more about the entire project, as well as the previous episodes of the video blog can be found on the Sonia Rappaport Legacy Trust website. Besides being a momentous conceptual art project that took the form of installations, performances, publications, and artist books, Objects on My Dresser is also pioneering in its turn to computing and data visualization. In this and the following episode, we're talking to three art historians and curators who can help us understand the context in which Rappaport engaged with coding, programming, and data visualization in the late 1970s and early 1980s. But first, let's talk about how the objects on the artist dresser became points on computer-generated charts. The crux of it, so to speak, which is that image of the net web, you know, that spider <laughs> web that she's using throughout the project, <laughs> and like, kind of unraveled and unpacked it and figured out the procedure, like the methodology or the procedure mm -hmm. she used to go from this 29 objects, very personal space, right? Like very interior, very mm -hmm. idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. And then she um, codes them. Um, she turns that those objects into eventually into a data set, right? By assigning various at, attributes to them. So first, really they're like material attributes, color, shape, material, right? And then assigning very, very personal attributes to them, like how they, these objects fit into her psychic space. <laughs> And then she created out of that this very like multi-layered data set that was processed um, and represented as what's called a, a, a spider plot, right? It's a particular kind of graph that used to represent this multi-layered kind of multi-dimensional data sets. And then that's how she ends up with the six axis thing that she calls net web that becomes the central image. So for people who don't understand this as a representation of data, like it looks like a spider web, like it looks, they just read it kind of as an image, right? But for people who understand it as a particular kind of graph, as a chart, right? They see that it's a representation of the data set, right? So there's different sort of stages to this coding that happen. In this episode, we're speaking with John Zarabel and Kelly Perkoff about Rappaport's turn to coding during the early 1980s and her questioning of the neutrality of data by revealing the personal biases that infuse it. John Zarabel is an art historian, curator, and writer teaching at the University of San Francisco. Formerly, he was curator at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and the Philadelphia Museum of Art. John has written for many art publications and catalogs and authored two books on the globalization of the art world. He contributed an insightful essay on the relationship between drawing and data in Sonia Rappaport's work to Pairing of Polarities, the book I edited in 2012. Welcome, John. When I was uh, asked to do an, uh, an essay for that catalog, Pairing Polarities, I really felt like one of the topics that would be a much 
a better way to catch a lot of the ideas that she was engaged with was to think about data, right? And to think about the way in which an artist uses data. Um, so my, 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 my essay for that was on data and drawing and really trying to focus it down onto a, a couple of series um, in, in her, um, you know, sort of 70s into the 80s, right? Which I thought, thought was a key, key moment of transition for her work. Um, and, you know, if we look back to that moment, right, the late 70s, early 80s, we see that computing has made advances um, beyond its sort of original uh, scientific military applications and gone into um, uh, far more areas. Uh, so by the 80s, we already see the first personal computers being offered on, you know, for the market. Um, and so this idea of, of computing and our lives, right, um, are, are just starting to be brought together. Um, so when Sonia gets into data, data is still something that's out there, right? It's a sort of scientific analysis. It's part of a, um, uh, you know, studies. Uh, you know, her husband was a chemist at UC Berkeley, so she was very savvy about, you know, scientific studies by Berkeley professors, you know, and, and how they were using data and how they were pushing the bounds of how you could use data and the technologies that were available to manipulate data. So what is data for an artist, right? Um, you know, you think about what an artist does when they um, say, sit outside and make a landscape drawing, right? The data is the visual cues that you get, right? Um, and, you know, impressionism starts to break that up into individual strokes so that you have a sort of more visible um, appreciation of the, the data points that they're looking at. When I look over there, I can see the light reflected off that boat and it, and it looks purple. So a purple, you know, you know, stroke. And then, you know, uh, that building up to this wonderful mosaic quality that, that's characteristic of those impressionist, early impressionist experiments, right? Mm -hmm. With her, the data was not just the visible world, right, um, but the invisible world. Um, and so she was interested in mining not only the conscious, but the subconscious, not only the immediate experience, but the abstract experience, um, which results from scientific inquiry, right, and particularly the way in which scientific inquiries can be um, turned into numerical equivalents. But because she's doing this all um, in collaboration with um, scientists, whether computer scientists, anthropologists, etc., right, or with machines, right, all together, right, then we end up with a, a real, you know, interesting, um, complex um, field of interactivity that, that sort of gives us a window, I think, onto a, a moment in the, you know, maybe the early or mid 80s, right, where computers start having this kind of impact on people, people having impact on computers. Um, uh, there's a whole cybernetic dynamic that's emerging, and she's able to capture that um, through uh, a series of works that originate with a bunch of things that were sitting on her dresser, right? Now, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so there's nothing, there is no separation, if you will, between our technology and, and our understanding of art and, and how art enters into the world. Um, and, and so, what's key is is that she's negotiating that transition right um and you, and most artists are are maybe watching that happen they're responding in a variety of ways you know if they're interested in that but but um there's not that many that were really engaged in the negotiation of that mm -hmm. um and the way in which the technology you know impacts our our subjectivity i think she's thinking about it and and bringing it to life in a different way she's um, if you will, a, a midwife, right, of the, the relationship between art and technology. Welcome, Kelly. Thank you for joining us today for this conversation about objects on my dresser. Uh, Kelly Perkoff is an art historian who studies the intersection of design, technology, and gender. Uh, she's a curatorial fellow at the Center for Craft in Asheville, North Carolina, where she curated the exhibition, The Computer Pays Its Debt, Women, Textiles and Technology, 1965 to 1985. Uh, the exhibition included Sonia Rappaport's work. She's also a visiting scholar at the Feminist Research Institute at UC Davis and a member of the editorial board um, of the Journal of Modern Craft. Like the common thread has been this um, data visualization and creating a data set that's counterintuitive because it's really based on very idiosyncratic 
sort of information that's highly personal, which brings into question the neutrality of what we think data sets are. Because <laughs> so, um, if you can like kind of thwart them or you can um, inject them with so much sort of personal and idiosyncratic, then, you know, then you think like, you can see the, the, the person or the people behind what we think are very orderly <laughs> traditional data sets. Yeah, and I, um, I mean, I'm just, I'm teaching a course on um, design methods right now. And I, I always tell my students that, you know, these technological tools are never neutral. Um, they may not be good, they may not be bad, but they're never neutral. Um, so for example, one of the recent projects, it was just from 2019 that I was going over with my students was a project by the name of ImageNet Roulette. Um, and this looks at one of the largest data sets for computer machine learning of um, visual information, which is a server by the name of ImageNet. Um, and this server has millions of images that have been categorized by human actors using Amazon's machine, Mechanical Turk um, platform in which people are paid incredibly low wages to in some senses cat, uh, categorize images. I think the average was 50 images a minute, you know, associating categories for um, 50 images a minute for these very low wages. And ImageNet then uses that categorization and makes this um, data set available to researchers who are exploring machine learning and uh, mechanical vision. And this project ImageNet Roulette, um, which was um, done by Trevor Paglin and, oh, the name of the woman is escaping me. Um, she's kind of one of the leading voices in um, facial, facial recognition technology and thinking about that in relation to justice and um, equity. And what their software allowed people to do was to upload a photo of themselves and have it coded and categorized in accordance with ImageNet's um, own system of categorization. And what they found was that, um, you know, white faces would often get categorized as, you know, probably inaccurate, but somewhat innocuous things like, you know, um, pipe smoker, newsreader, you know, economist, you know, nothing too out of the ordinary. While the majority of Black individuals would simply be characterized as Black or as often quite racist or misogynistic terms. And what this project really shows is that this data set that someone might think of as neutral, right? It's just data is in no way neutral, but is incredibly reflective of the human bias of the people who did the categorization. And this has really serious implications as you know, this saw these data sets are being used in airports for security screening. Um, they're being used um, by Fortune 500 companies in interviews. They're being used by police departments. Um, so the thinking through the um, real world implications of the dangerous assumption that these data sets are neutral is, you know, it's, it's chilling. <laughs> Yeah. Rappaport both embraced and challenged the emerging computer technologies and expressed an awareness of their biases, particularly their gender biases. For instance, she adopted the standard spider chart to become a web of mother-daughter relationships. Line graphs were used to visualize her experience of very personal relics. She mined her own and other people's psychic spaces to gather data in a gesture that became an absurdist counterpoint to the standard scientific process. Thank you to our guests today for bringing such different perspectives to bear on our understanding of this essential aspect of the Objects on My Dresser project. We greatly appreciate their time and look forward to uh, the next conversation on another facet of objects on my dresser, the materiality of coding, programming, and data processing. <laughs>